to infinity and beyond. This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am the father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the film room. It's been a minute, but we are back to celebrate Hollywood's biggest night. Zach Owens and Johnny Sobchak here for another episode. We're talking Oscars, the Oscars recap show. Big night. Lots of stuff happened. Lots of big wins for uh, inside the film room fans. And we are also talking about the MCU's latest show, Moon Knight, which releases this week on Disney+. Plus. But before we get into that, Johnny, how are you? It's been since the Batman that we last spoke, which means you've seen the Batman another five times since then, right? Something like that? <laughs> yes, I've seen it a total of six times. That is that is true. And still, still good? Still holds up? Shit, shit doesn't get old, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy for you. I still have not even seen that second time because I keep trying to get wow. my fiance to go to the freaking movies with me, but she's always working and being busy and just not prioritizing the Batman over, over <laughs> other things. So I may just have, I think she would like it. You gotta, gotta get her in there before it. Uh, I know. I know she's, I, I think I've mentioned it before, but like silence of the lambs, big fan prisoners, Zodiac seven loves all those movies. So I know she would like it. Yeah, definitely. Especially because HBO max, well, it's still like three weeks away, I guess, but it gives you this little bit of time before she has that, that cop out. Yeah. If anything, I will force her to watch it on HBO Max. But enough about enough about my fiance's failures at the movie theater. Uh, let's get down to, as she gives me a puppy dog look through the the doorway here. <laughs> um, let's get down to business. What's what's been going on? It like it's been three weeks, four weeks since our podcast. What's what's new in the world of Johnny? Anything other than uh, just your victory lap for the Oscars? Oh man. Yeah, it's been, uh, this was a wild little last 24 hours or so. (laughs) Um, It's been, I mean, it's been pretty much Batman all the time. Um, I've, I've watched, I've watched a movie basically 10 times this year or this month rather in March. And six of those times have been Batman. So (laughs) um, the others and two and three of those or two of those others were at home. Uh, I did manage to catch X, um, the the new A twenty four film, yep. and then I also hit the Lost City with Sandra Bullock and uh, Channing Tatum over the weekend. I uh, had a little fun, fun random date night out with my girlfriend to go see that, uh, and we both had a, a good good fun time with that. So uh, it's been pretty casual, nothing too crazy. It's kind of it is that kind of a lull period that was kind of almost induced by the Batman releasing at the start of the month, uh, but we can look look forward to some more bigger newer releases popping up uh starting in april for sure for sure well like we said the oscars recap will be the main uh the main part of the episode we're talking a little bit of news catching up on just two things here but two very big things that are very applicable to our show that we want to cover from the last couple weeks and then talking a little moon night but before we dive in Be sure to go and subscribe to the Rewind newsletter so you can get everything from inside the film room delivered straight to your inbox, like something very exciting that's coming up soon. We got the chance to speak with Cola Bikini from Ted Lasso. He plays Isaac McAdoo, the captain of AFC Richmond. So we will be having some more Ted Lasso interviews coming your way, as well as a new Ted Lasso giveaway that we just popped up on social media. It's giving away a jersey, a visor, and a scarf, all to one lucky winner. So be sure you're subscribed to the Rewind so you're eligible for that. 
And, you know, on top of all that, you just get our Johnny and I delivered straight to you makes life easy. So it's a win-win scenario for everyone involved. Dang. But I, you know, I don't think I can sell it any better than that. But uh, diving in a little bit on my front, I also saw X, got, got to check that out and was very pleased with, with what we got there. I know that was one that we kind of had mixed feelings about when we saw the trailer, didn't really know how to, how to react, um, but it was fun. It was very like the, the nostalgic throwback to the, the 70s slasher, the, the simplicity of it, but also like kind of leaning into the tropes um but it's it's this is how long it's been since we last podcasted i've seen turning red which came out at the beginning of the month uh deep water on hulu and fresh on hulu um so those have been my movies but still you know this is the year of tv for zach we've been cranking survivor season 42 kicked off still (laughs) going strong loving it um i finished how i met your father on hulu And, you know, right when I thought that that show, I was ready to give up the season finale, pulled on those How I Met Your Mother heartstrings, my my OG fandom, (laughs) and it got me convinced that I need to stick around for season two. So it got me into the trap, Um, finished Snowpiercer season three, Um, that so so just cranking away on TV and then started Moon Knight, of course, and then all and with all of that going on, I am four episodes away from my epic 96 episode binge of the OC. So that'll be an emotional Good. conclusion as well. Um, so a lot has been churning over here, but it's all it's all been good stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it all. So let's get into some news here, Johnny, as we start the episode. This happened a couple weeks ago at this point, but as a it, we're, we're called inside the film room but it's kind of like the subtitle is like the dune podcast uh because there's just so much <laughs> dune content coming from you specifically but we finally got some casting news for part two and i i believe we're we're pleased with this is that is that correct johnny oh man uh, over the moon i was just i was popping off last night um both literally in the physical realm as well as on Twitter. And uh, it, it was pretty much everything I wanted to see, hope to see, minus, you know, best director, best picture, which we, we will wait. We will wait until part two, I understand, um, even if I don't really. But um, as far as the the, uh, the arts, uh, including, you know, film editing. I think cinematography- you're getting ahead of yourself, Johnny. I think you're getting ahead of yourself. We're talking about the casting news. Oh no! Part two. Oh man, Dune save Dune the Dune. save the victory lap for for the Oscars recap. But we're talking Dune Part Two casting news. Princess Aurelian and Fade Ralta. What do we think? Who who's who's stepping up here in Part Two? I don't know if I pronounced those names right. <laughs> Um, well, as far as Dune Part Two, uh, looking ahead to what they're filming this summer, the you know coming off this wave of hype now that they just won six Oscars, um, spoiler alert. But you have Florence Pugh uh, supposedly in discussions in talks to play Princess Irulan, and you know Florence Pugh is one of those kind of big hot names right now, especially for the younger crop of actors. She's kind of up there with. Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya and, and Tom Holland, their names are always floating around the same kind of projects, the big, you know, whether it's blockbusters or art house or prestige pictures. She's, you know, in Christopher Nolan's next film. Uh, she was in Little Women a couple of years ago with Timothy Chalamet. And I can definitely see her fitting uh, Princess Irulan um, fairly well. Uh, she's a mostly nondescript character, especially in the first book. Um, but there is definitely a lot of potential there to expand that role. And I think Florence Pugh has the chops to really do anything that Denis asks of her in that role. Uh, and I think that if you get someone as talented as Florence Pugh to actually join up with this cast, then you do expand her role. You do give her a little bit more to chew on, at least for filming and then see what happens and what, what makes it into the movie. Um, and I, I love Florence Pugh. I mean, ever since Midsommar came out, almost three years ago now, I have just 
really been kind of riding that train. I really liked her in Little Women as well. And so, uh, you know, I haven't, I, I didn't watch Hawkeye. I uh, haven't, haven't been so much keen on her MCU uh, role. I didn't like Black Widow very much, but she is definitely growing. Uh, her profile is growing and she's becoming a stronger, you know, not only a, a, as an actor, but stronger as like a draw. And that could certainly help with the box office there as well. Um, and then on the flip side of that, we have uh, Austin Butler supposedly is in discussions as well to play Fade Rautha Harkonnen, which is the Baron's nephew. Uh, and, and Fade is supposed to be sort of like a dark mirror image of Paul. He's supposed to be kind of this um, a little bit older, maybe a little bit stronger and bigger kind of uh, more uh, enticing or more charismatic, uh, more attractive, like Harkonnen alternative to the Baron or to uh, the Beast or Bon, uh, you know, Stellan Skarsgård's character and Dave Bautista's character. Uh, they He is kind of the, the pretty boy and he is very much full of himself and thinks that he is the one that should be uh, positioned to take over and, and, and take over not only the Harkonnen family, but also the, you know, the, the empire potentially, um, you know, if Baron's plans go accordingly. So there's really interesting dynamic that can build from there. Again, not the biggest character in the books, but a pivotal character as far as his role and, and how that plays out, especially with regards to Paul and like the Baron. Um, and so that there's definitely an interesting bridge there and, and Austin Butler haven't really seen him in much of anything. I was very surprised when I heard his name come across. I did not expect him ever. He was never a name that popped up. Uh, I know a lot of people were talking about Barry Keon and, and Robert Pattinson even came up in discussion in the last like month or so with Batman hype. And then, uh, you know, there were some other names, Ty Sheridan, Harry Styles, which were both supposedly in, in discussions or potentially competing, for now, it looks like this could be Austin Butler's, uh, you know, to to lose. And I, again, I don't really know what to think of him. I can see it. I certainly see the potential there. And I don't think Denis can get less than a great performance out of someone. And I also think the, the Elvis biopic, which is coming up, is supposed to be premiering at Cannes Film Festival in, in, in May. Supposedly that movie, I don't know about the movie itself necessarily. Um, not everyone's going to like Baz Luhrmann. But I heard he is really good in it. And I think that buzz, and this is another Warner Brothers production, could be kind of building there. And, and they, there could be some more, you know, reason to be attracted to him uh, with some upcoming, bigger, bigger upcoming roles. Well, obviously, you're the, the resident expert. So I trust your judgment here. Um, I know you mentioned a couple of the other people that were um, up for, for Fade's role. But another one that we had seen a lot for uh, the Princess Arulian is um Anya Taylor Joy mm. is there anything one versus the other if it is if it does end up being Florence Pugh is that a better decision in your in your mind or would you have preferred to see an Anya Taylor Joy take on that I haven't seen that much of Anya Taylor Joy I've probably seen about roughly equal like amounts of acting from those two Anya Taylor Joy I'm really most familiar with from The Witch, which was years ago at this point, and then Split. I haven't seen The Queen's Gambit. Uh, I know that's really like her best, like most you know, in interesting role to date. Uh, Florence Pugh, I've seen like in Midsommar, and then and then Little Women, um, and Black Widow, of course. I think, I I think I prefer Pugh like as an actor. Like I think I I think that there's a lot of like really, especially raw talent there. I really like Anya Taylor Joy as well. I liked her in Last Night in Soho. That was a little good role for her. Um, but I'm not like blown away by her necessarily. I was blown away by Florence Pugh in Midsommar, especially for her mm -hmm. first like bigger performance that I'd seen. So, and I think that I, I loved seeing her and Chalamet together in Little Women. So I think I would like to see them kind of reunite for this and her, Zendaya and Chalamet, I think would be a really cool trio moving forward with this franchise yeah i agree with that um i feel like they just have very different vibes as yeah, like absolutely as, as people as people not even like their characters yeah but just like social media presence their look the, like so it's interesting that like two very different people yeah were kind of considered considered for the same character like you said it's it's pretty like nondescript so it's not like 
there was like a form that they're trying to fit with this yeah. character with the casting so that they, they could go really any direction but i think it, that that was just fascinating to me but austin butler like you said um i think my biggest thing with him is is once upon a time in hollywood um yes yes that's true and he's he's creepy but charm like i don't know if charming is the right word for that role but like yeah he's good in that he, yeah he's like I'll go ahead and say it. I'll say for for is like a, a murdering psychopath. Like he's charming, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I get that. We still need the emperor to be cast uh, mm. to finish off this trio of of new. Uh, there will obviously be other new characters, but yeah. but these are the big three um, yeah. for part two. Is there anyone in particular Man. that you have in mind? I know. <laughs> um, uh, I think I saw somewhere somebody suggested to you Charles Dance, um, but that they you were not a fan of that because of uh, you yeah. didn't want it to be too close to a Thrones comparison. Yeah, that's just too similar. Like as soon as he would show up on screen, you'd be like, "Oh, it's it's Game of Thrones guy. It's it's right. it's Lannister. It's like, oh, it's Godzilla, King of the Monsters guy. <laughs> you mean? <laughs> right. It's like you can't it's so hard to separate him from that character and like there's already so much comparison i feel like you can draw between dune and game of thrones Mm -hmm. um game of thrones certainly took a good amount of inspiration from dune just like star wars did um i and also to be quite frank he doesn't fit the the description now i'm not saying the book description is the end all be all by any means i think there's plenty of latitude there Uh, you know just look at Liet kynes i mean that was a, a white dude in the book and it was played by sharon duncan brewster masterfully so um there's all the latitude but the emperor is supposed to be an older man like 70s potentially which would fit charles dance but he's supposed to have he's supposed to look younger and act younger because of his spice um you know ingestion and and so i think you need someone that is like could be reasonable like maybe 40s or something like that like not not that old like middle-aged ish um even maybe 50s potentially i think someone that could be believable as florence Pugh's father and that's another thing you have to consider with the casting now is that florence Pugh is i mean she's a fucking she's a white girl so obviously the emperor is going to be white now where there was a, again there was a lot of question about what where are they going to go as far as casting before now it's fairly limited or like narrowed down based on that um i keep my brain this is a complete fan cast there's no reason to believe this would ever happen i don't anticipate it would happen but i think if i could hand pick someone and just plug them into this cast i think i would go with michael fassbender um i really like that idea not really sure why exactly but i believe him as like an like an imperial like kind of figure and I see him, I also picture him with like the blonde like hair, like a blonde wig almost like what he had in the Alien movies. Um, I feel like that could match up really well with like what they could do with Florence Pugh uh, and her hair. Um, So I think that there's, and I could believe that like his age and everything. I think you could really dress him up and have him play because the Emperor is, he's like, he's uh, jealous and he's insecure and he's, uh, but he's also very powerful and he has this, you know, this violent, you know, uh tyrannical almost rule that he uses and i think michael fassbender can play all that and play charismatic and play like insecure and like you know almost like weaselly you know what i mean i think that there's a Mm -hmm. lot he can do there and he hasn't been to be you know completely frank he hasn't really been in that many great movies in recent years especially big blockbuster movies he's been stuck with the alien and and the x-men and so i would really like to see him work with denis villeneuve i'd like to see him work in a big high profile high quality blockbuster again i think that'd be really cool but i'm open to all sorts of ideas not not by any means married to that well it seems like everything you've said about dune has come true so i would not be surprised <laughs> when we see michael fassbender cast that would be so emperor. hey fingers crossed well speaking of barry keown and moving from dune to what he, he is now doing because he's not doing dune part two we got the deleted scene from the Batman. Obviously, in, in the Batman, there's the, the tease of Riddler's new friend in prison. And we got to see um, something that you had mentioned in the past of like a, a test screening that included a certain scene of a certain character. And this, this was that scene after the, 
the rat Alada website had gone mm-hmm. through all of the Easter eggs and the, the stunt that that was, uh, we, it culminated in this deleted scene in which Batman goes to the Joker, Hannibal Lecter style, seeking uh, advice on a case or on, on the Riddler's case to, to get into his mind. And, and we get this back and forth between them. There's obviously history. There's, um, they have just recently had their like first back and forth, it seems. And yeah, uh, and mm-hmm. we don't get the perfect clear look at his face, but mm-hmm. lots of teases, lots of bits and pieces that you can put together. Yeah. Reactions to, to the scene itself, to whether it should have or should not have been included in the film. Just overall, overall thoughts on this character. <sighs> yeah, so I pretty much said right off rip that um, definitely did, didn't need this in the movie. So I think Matt Reeves absolutely made the right call by not including it. I think it's a fun postscript. You don't need it. It doesn't do anything. If anything, I think it would weaken the movie if you included it. I think there's so much subtext in, you know, in the film that is kind of made text by this scene. The Joker really, and it makes sense because the Joker is supposed to be profiling Riddler and the Batman knows that the Joker is a very keen criminal mind. And, and so he does a good job deciphering who is Riddler. What does he want? What does it say about you, Batman? But it's almost too, too blatant and too obvious. Like in your face, I feel like it would really, I feel like there's so much great stuff that kind of comes to light and surfaces in the third act and in the finale that is really kind of basically just spelled out for the audience here. So I, I can understand why it was cut. I don't think it was necessarily the best writing as far as that goes. Um, and Matt Reeves is smart enough to know that. And, and that's why he made a great decision to cut it. But it's also a very well shot scene. It's a well acted scene. Uh, it, it is. And as far as, as far as the writing goes and the dialogue, it's a well constructed scene in that sense where it feels so out of the comics as far as like the banter between Joker and Batman uh, in this sort of scenario in Arkham uh, Joker is really toying with Batman in some ways but he's also showing off his intelligence and his his acumen uh, I think it it's and, and I, I love the way it was shot talking about the way the cinematography works all the little close-ups and the very shallow depth of field and that focus and always keeping Joker at an arm's reach. And so it's like really drawing you in and you, you're really struggling to like make out the details, but it makes him almost more terrifying and more scary because you can't really quite see what he looks like. And and then working that, of course, with the close-ups with Pattinson as Batman, who is just, it's not Pattinson as Batman, like he is Batman. And, and he's again, just fantastic in the scene where he's not saying or doing a lot, but his face and his eyes are doing so much. And his, his body language, it just, it all, it all really worked well for me. I thought it was a really good scene and I'm so happy they released it. I'm so glad we got to see more of Barry Keen in this role and, and it does add some value to the film itself, but you don't need it. You didn't need it. And I think the big thing that it left me with is prior to this scene, I was like, okay, Joker, I could take or leave it. Like, I don't necessarily need the Joker in this, in this trilogy later in this series, I like Barry Keen as an actor. I think he would do a great job in that role. After watching this, I feel like my opinion flipped to, okay, I really actually do want to see more of this. Like I want more Joker. I want more of this dynamic. Um, not, not, not necessarily as him as like the big villain of the next movie, maybe another shorter cameo. Um, but I think down the line, maybe in the third film, if there was like a, you know, a finale to the trilogy feasibly, I think he'd be a great kind of end game style villain that we build up over the course of a couple yeah. of movies and then make him the centerpiece at the end yeah i'm i'm definitely with you there that was my stance leaving the movie that i wanted to get again sprinkle him in in the second one and have him be the big bad in the third movie and i stand by that even though i do want more of him now um mm-hmm. but this felt like the I, i'm with you in the sense that I'm, I'm glad this was not in the actual movie because it felt very much like that post credits easter egg like teaser kind of thing um Mm. that like i'm glad also that it was not a post credit scene it wouldn't have made sense because it was about the the riddler um yeah but they could have they could have made something like this as a post credits in which they're talking about a different different case or something but um i like it as the deleted scene i like that it's this standalone kind of like if you see it you see it and it adds to it but you, you don't need to see it it's not like yeah 
the people who are not like us, like waiting online for Batman post notifications. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, definitely, definitely the, the better decision to remove it. Although, like you said, it, it whets the appetite even more for this character and, and shows the, the take that, that we're going to get mm -hmm. here and, and just makes me want it even more. So I'm, I'm glad that we got it, but I'm also very glad that in the way that we got it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I think I tweeted this as well, just as a culmination of the, of just an excellent five-star marketing campaign especially the viral marketing with this with this website um included i think it was just a really nice uh, you know kind of sending off point and then today this afternoon we got the uh really it seems like it might will probably be the last alert or notification for that um for at least the time being but maybe forever where it says the gotham city police department has seized <laughs> the riddler's website and so there's no longer going to be any uh transmissions coming out of there but Good timing. Now we just got to turn our to our eyes to the sequel whenever we hear any news of that, which I'd imagine is quite a ways away, but no rush. Well, we will be anxiously awaiting that news when it does come, but let's shift gears into last night's big event, the culmination of, of months of movies and speculation and predictions and, and dissection. Uh, I know you're eager to get into your your cave and hibernate after a, a lengthy award season, but we got to hash it all out here. The Oscars came and it was a big night for Dune, among other things. Uh, no real big surprises. We were talking about this before we started recording. As far as like the the big awards, everything kind of played out as expected. Coda took home Best Picture as the, big, the biggest winner of the night. Um, but that was something that had kind of been building over the last couple of weeks that by the time that it actually happened, it didn't actually end up being the surprise that people thought it would be a month or two ago. But obviously the biggest surprise, the, the Will Smith, Chris Rock interaction, Johnny, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily feel a calling to, to dive into the slap herd around the world for a 30 minute segue. I, I, I don't know. You, you tell me. No, I mean, <laughs> What what's there really to say at this point? I mean, I don't think you or I is going to provide a take that has not been <laughs> been taken. It has already. not been taken. Yeah, um, it's yeah. It's just I don't even feel like like literally commenting on it at all. To be honest, I mean, it is what it is. It was wild. It'll never be forgotten. I'm glad I got to see it live. Um, for the time that I was watching, it was pretty nuts. Um, just when you thought Moonlight and La La Land finale can be topped uh one of the biggest movie stars of all time just slapping the shit out of chris rock <laughs> one of the most famous comedians of all time uh on live television in front of everyone at the oscars that that's well, that's cinema baby i will say that as far as the show as a whole obviously lots of controversy around the the production of the oscars and the the decision not to not to give out eight awards during the actual show, but to pre-tape it and stitch it into the into the broadcast um, in an effort to shorten the show and make it more appealing to, to larger audiences when in fact the show still went for three hours and 40 minutes uh, longer than last year's Oscars. And we got good moments with Zack Snyder's Justice League, um, the entering the speed, the speed zone, speed speed force i don't know um <laughs> speed but force. army of thieves got a shout out another great highlight for the army show. of the dead oh man i don't just, get it twisted is, i'm just, the Zack snyder world is just doing me dirty this this <laughs> podcast um but with all that being said like the show itself was fairly disastrous um i would say and what they were hoping to accomplish was not accomplished and making it more appealing to the wider audience, making it quicker and more succinct. But the Will Smith incident obviously provided a spark for the evening, the, the, the got the people talking on Twitter um, and made this a very memorable event. I don't think that's what the Academy was looking for as they have condoned the actions of Will Smith or not condoned the action, condemned, that's the word I'm looking for. They've condemned the actions. Um, but, you know, made headlines one way or another. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a, just a cluster, uh, wasn't it? 
I mean, as you pointed out, they went to every single length to make it more entertaining and like funnier and, and also shorter. Um, but they made it as long and as unfunny and as not entertaining apart from a crazy unscripted, like wild moment, uh, as possible. So I, I just, uh, I have no idea where the hell they're supposed to go from here. First case, uh, you know, that you come across the desk is get the, get all the damn categories presented live again, this BS about editing it. It didn't work whatsoever. Um, and it looked like garbage and it sounded like garbage and I hated it. And I just feel like you really have to give everyone their due instead of trying to truncate and min and cut down on just the most minimal. I mean, how much time was saved by editing those? I mean, honestly, I mean, they cut some of, they cut the walking out and then they cut literally a little, some portions of their speech here and there. Like you're saving probably less. I mean, it has to be less than 10 minutes is what I would say. Um, but like, I, I just don't know. It, it, it was so many weird, like from what I saw, like so many weird, like jokes and like just the humor fell off and like, it just all felt like tasteless and like classless. And it's supposed to be like, I'm not, I'm not trying to be, I'm not, I'm not by any means a prude. And I don't think you, like there's a need to like police the humor, or, like think that something is highbrow or lowbrow. But it's the Oscars. Like it's supposed to be like a, a big, you know, like prestigious event. And and this is like we're trying to honor art, like some of the best art in the world. And you, you know, there are stars there, of course, and that's part of it. Um, the fashion and everything else. But ultimately it should be about the movies and it should be about respect for the the art form and respect for the artists in the room. And to me, it felt like they were constantly like disrespecting like the artists they were disrespecting the films like i just don't get why it needs to be turned to like this as some other people were saying like a variety like comedy show like it's just it, it, it just it's frustrating and um you know it, it is what it is we'll see if they change it um i hope i mean the ratings did go up somewhat compared to last year although last year you have to think about the fact that no one really saw any movies in 2020 so that probably had a, a big factor um but yeah, I don't know. It, it's just the only saving grace is really my Dune stuff. I, was, I, I pretty much that, that's what I'll say about it. Well, let's get into that. The actual winners of the night. Um, as far as the, the big ones, like I said, Coda took home best picture. We got the, the, the quite possibly like the most locked in as far as acting categories that this was known month in advance that Will Smith was going to win best actor um the the most up in the up for grabs was jessica chastain winning best actress for eyes of tammy faye uh ariana debose for west side story best supporting actress and then troy kotzer for coda for best supporting actor those no surprises there um jane campion best director again and one that was locked in months and months ago um so let's go below the line with some of the technical categories and and it was a pretty much a dune sweep almost johnny i know that was music to your ears um yeah i was just totally elated and uh you know i did as you said it was fairly predictable i was 100 percent right about everything i said was going to happen uh vir- you know virtually at least and 22 of 23 categories um certainly wasn't the only one to be predicting a lot of it a lot of them were predictable across the board but I stuck to my guns on some that people were kind of running away from like Dune in film editing or Dune in production design, Dune in cinematography for Greg Frazier. I, uh, I was just so happy to see that those all panned out and I, like I thought they deserved. And of course, you know, you had the, the no brainers for Dune like sound or visual effects and score Hans Zimmer seemed like kind of a given as well. Uh, but just to see it all come together and, and, you know, after years of hyping up this movie and saying that this is exactly what was going to happen, to see it come to fruition, you know, for the most part, I still wish Denis had gotten his due for director. And of course, of course, you know, I don't see how a film can get 10 nominations and win six Oscars and not be right there in the best picture conversation and the best director conversation. But I suspect, you know, a couple of years from now, Dune part this two. This was setting out. the stage, Johnny. It's clear that the support is there and he's coming for it all with part two. Yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be a, a return of the king style situation, especially because 
I really don't think people realize, especially if they haven't read the book, just how fucking epic this second movie is going to be. And everything that you thought was great about this first part is going to be even greater, I think, in part two. So, And it's going to be a bigger success, I think, at the box office. Um, more Oscar nominations, more wins. I mean, Denis Villeneuve coming for it. It's going to be awesome. They're filming it in a few months. They're filming it late summer, early fall. Uh, we do have more casting you know, to look forward to as well as we were talking earlier in the show and, and to get confirmation for Florence Pugh, hopefully, and Austin Butler and, and to see what happens with the Emperor. There's just going to be a lot of hype. It's going to be a big, high-profile project, um, you know, even bigger than the first one. So I'm really excited and, and I just really couldn't be happier with it. I was jumping up and down. I was yelling, scaring the shit out of my girlfriend and and celebrating with some drinks and whatnot. It, it, was, it was a good time. Um, super happy to see it and, and just, you know, richly deserved. Well, it'll only be a matter of time until uh, your honorary Oscar shows up in the mail. I believe that they, uh, they'll they be sending you one for, for all best, of the faith, the skill. support, the hype. Uh, it was, uh, you were uh, right there with them every step of the way, it seems like. <laughs> but for me, uh, a big, big time, big time shout out for Oscar winner, Billie Eilish, No Time mm. to Die, banger, banger of a song. Um Let's let's hope that she uh, back to back weekends from the Oscars to the Grammys. That could be could be a big seven day period for her and and Phineas. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also got a shout out to our 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 friend of the show uh, of the site, uh, Donald Mowat. He was there, uh, of course, nominated for Dune makeup and hairstyling with his his uh, cohort and. You know, unfortunately, you know, they didn't get the win. It went to uh, the eyes of Tammy Faye. But um, I, I just was very pleased and, and was happy talking to him, talking about his kind of experience and wishing him luck and everything. So um, hell of an Oscars to go to for your first, I would I would imagine. Um, <laughs> but certainly won't be his last. Looking forward to see what what he does, come, cooks up for, for part two. Agreed. Well, you teed it up perfectly there, bringing up Donald Mowat, because that's the segue into our discussion about Moon Knight, Donald Mowat, the uh, head of makeup for Moon Knight, working with Oscar Isaac once again over there. But let's let's dive in here. I know you have not seen it yet. I have watched the first four episodes. Um, we got the screeners. This hits Disney Plus this coming Wednesday on March 30th um, with the first episode. It's a six episode miniseries, um, the next in the Disney Plus era of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oscar Isaac, Ethan Hawke leading the way, a former U.S. Marine struggling with dissociative identity disorder is granted the powers of an Egyptian moon god, but he soon finds out that these newfound powers can be both a blessing and a curse to his troubled life. This, I don't know about you, let, let me ask you, what is your familiarity with Moon Knight heading into the premiere of this show because for me i i had never heard of it i had never read it watched it le learned anything about it until like this show was first announced yeah yeah so not yeah similar to you most likely I hadn't really heard of moon knight before hadn't read anything seen anything uh vaguely knew that he people always compared him to batman um for whatever reason i don't know if it's the cape or the violence or what um but uh, yeah, so I really didn't have much expectation or like a preconception for this. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. And even once we did know it was coming, like I did not know much. I, it's not like I dove in and, and researched or anything like that. Um, so pretty much was going in blind here. Um, and I, it, it's, it's a very interesting feeling because it is like, I know this comes up time and time again that like this doesn't feel like Marvel. Um, but this, this one of all of the, the projects so far, it very much did feel like not, I'm, I'm still trying to decide if it's like a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> um, cause like it, it, it seems almost in a way, like, I don't see how this is going to connect to just knowing how the Marvel universe works, you know, like, I don't see like this character lining up next to Spider-Man or like, I don't see how this, this story connects <laughs> to, um like weave into the universe into the the movies or other shows or anything because it does very much feel like its own standalone thing yeah. um through four episodes like obviously i'm not going to go into to plot details or spoilers or anything but um through four episodes there's like no mention whatsoever you know it seems like every property now is like 
ever since the blip or like ever since the snap, like, you know, like Spider-Man mentions it or like Captain America, like everything is like post blip. Um, no mentions whatsoever of that. No, no mentions of other heroes or, or just superheroes in general. Um, so this seems like very much this completely separate entity. Um, so I'm interested to see how that goes beyond the, the six episodes here, but it's a cool exploration of like this, like I said, that with, with that, that separation, it kind of opens up to just being its own completely new thing. Um, it, it's diving into the, the Egyptian lore and, and gods and heroes and all of that. Um, so it, it's cool to kind of see this new territory that hasn't really been touched before in, in Marvel shows, but Oscar Isaac, essentially I I don't think I knew this going in again I have not like I was not prepping for this show so maybe people who who are more familiar with it or looking forward to it more uh know more but essentially playing two characters here he's the dis dissociative identity disorder there's like this one version it's this like British man named Stephen who works at a museum and then there's Mark Spector who is like the the comics character and he's this former U.S. Marine secret agent killer. Um, so, and he like, go, they fight for control of the body, go back and forth uh, as to who's in charge. And it's almost like this Venom-esque like narrative where like on top of those two personalities going back and forth, there's this Egyptian God that <laughs> is giving him the powers. Um, and so that he can see this god and it's like this deep voice very similar to venom it's like no mark you have to do like this like i don't know weird venom comparisons are not what i wanted to hear <laughs> not 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 anything in like plot or whatsoever but it's just like this like almost like a not a narrator voice even because like he talks back and forth between it but it's like just this yeah. voice that no one can hear except for him yeah. and like i haven't even seen the Ven the new venom movie but like i know that that's from the, the snippet in spider-man you know how it like talks to yeah to eddie um but i was very caught off guard by this ethan hawk playing a, a almost like a cult leader of a different egyptian god um yeah spooky off-putting um he, he's his hair his hair is is the most off-putting thing is that the most um, spooky thing but i would say um the the very opening scene i will say that it's it's him cracking open like shattering a glass like a, a cup putting yeah. the glass in his sandals and then walking like for the day what the hell so that was very disturbing that was like some uh first reformed shit like putting <laughs> putting barbed wire around him and um so maybe he thought he was in the wrong the wrong movie there that hasn't come back up since then so I don't know if that's just like this quirky character trait for him or if it's going to be yeah. um, readdressed at a later date. Um, but, you know, the, the I will say the first one or two episodes, I was not like, I was intrigued, but I wasn't like hooked or anything. The fourth one, which the, I, I believe this is probably why they gave us four episodes to watch. Um, the fourth one was like the most interesting and it like really takes what you've seen so far and kind of twists it all um in a pretty big way and mm -hmm. then leaves you on a good cliffhanger so for me that's going to be four weeks out from wednesday um so jesus it'll be like that'll be like may before i'm watching a new episode of moon night because I, I don't expect to get five and six in screeners so yeah um i'll probably need a refresher by the time that that, that live episode actually comes around but I know I've kind of been monologuing here for a while. Any questions as someone who has not seen it yet or, or will potentially be watching it? Anything you want to know? Oh, so many. Um, I mean, okay, so there, there was, you, you alluded to it a little bit, but I want to hear some, some hard answers here, Zach. Okay, let's, let's the, hear it. The, the Marvel fans, Marvel themselves, Oscar Isaac, Kevin Feige, They've talked about so much about how this this one's really going to push the limits. This one's really going to go go hard with what the Marvel universe has seen with regards to blood and violence and and darkness and and mm -hmm. etc. Is it true? There, is it true? Um, is that app? Is that app? There is there is blood. 
um there is death like legit death not just like ambiguous like oh is that bad guy dead we're not gonna look into it um but as we know it is still like the same tv rating as all of the other marvel shows um through four episodes there has not been a ton of moon knight of the actual like hero Hmm. villain whatever you want to call it um because like the the duality of those two characters mark specter is like i feel about that hearing this i I was very (laughs) surprised by it um because the the mark specter character is like the one who basically like mark specter has the relationship with the egyptian god and like goes back and forth between being moon knight and wearing the suit and like doing all of this stuff and then like the steven character was unaware of all of it and then like learns about it and and is like very appalled by the behavior and the violence and tries to like stuff it all down and so like when steven's in charge there is no moon knight basically and it's there is no violence or or fighting so it's like i i I was very surprised that is one of the things i was very surprised that and just like the lack of time that moon knight the the hero villain whatever was like on screen and and actively like doing action um but when he is it is cool it is cool it is very like i mean it's not like anything that i'm like holy shit this is violent um (laughs) but like it does have some similarities to like the batman like aggressive punching multiple times over and over you know like oh oh, more than just like a one punch from cap or something like that um but as far it's not it's not anything earth shattering in my opinion okay okay um so is it would you say you say it's not earth shattering so you you would say (laughs) maybe it doesn't quite reach the level that we may maybe have been like led to believe but it's still kind of a different vibe than It, it is it is a different vibe um and I mean, even even when Moon Knight is not on screen, Mark sometimes still is like fighting uh, as yeah. like Oscar Isaac. So and there's like some like like there's a cool knife fight that he's in. Um, and like so, uh, sometimes the like because of like the dissociative disorder, yeah. like sometimes they'll like switch from one character the, to the other. And it's like this gap because yeah. of like you don't know what happened as the other character. <laughs> and it like they'll wake up to like violence having happened so like you'll see like the aftermath but not necessarily like what goes down um interesting so yeah anything anything else before uh okay before you dive into here's another thing that i've been kind of itching uh, about and i have been very skeptical of um based on what i've seen now you've seen four episodes which is a lot more than i've seen just in the promotional materials this this show looks, from what I've seen, it looks kind of wonky in some areas as far as like the visuals and maybe some of the effects. Um, as far as like the actual quality of it, the 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 uh, the effects on like the action maybe CG blue screen stuff as well as even Moon Knight himself I think has been a real sticking point for me. I feel like in all and you said he's not in it very much really. But in like all the promotional material I've seen, I feel like, and maybe this is a testament to the effect. I don't know if it's a testament to the costume design necessarily or what it would be if it's not what I think it is. But like, I I feel like I have yet to see a real shot of this character. I feel like every time I see him, it's like a CG double or like some weird, like, I don't know what the hell they're doing. Um, I'm wondering how much, I mean, you said Moon Knight isn't in it very much, but I'm like, as Moon Knight, is Oscar Isaac like is he wearing a suit at any point like is he actually in there like what is going on there? I, yeah I so the way that it works is like the it's almost like similar to Iron Man how like the suit like builds around him like it, right. it just like grows around him so like when he does put on the um the suit it just kind of like comes out of nowhere and morphs onto him yeah but like when he is actually doing it like the suit is there there's two different versions of it like Steven has a version of the suit which is like the like coat and jacket like prop the one with like that ski mask look almost um and that's because he's like the prim and proper like english guy and then the like more traditional one that you've seen with like the the mummy look to it is is the mark suit um but 
those the suit itself has looked fine to me um there was definitely some like cg stuff that was very evident in the there's like one a big car chase um oh yeah that that looks sus it's giving far from home vibe yeah yeah i i i would not disagree with that (laughs) um (laughs) but there hasn't been any other than that scene there hasn't been anything like particularly like outstanding yeah in a bad way like particularly like noticeable um that's made me be like okay this is not good but I'm also like far less like keen on just like my eye is not as like searching for that as you are sometimes so so maybe it might be different for you last last heater question okay leave you leave you thinking do you think Oscar Isaac ever once wore a Moon Knight costume while making the show (laughs) yeah just let somebody else handle that I feel like that definitely I mean because like when like I said he's not in a ton as in that suit and when it is it's mainly stunts so I would have to imagine that that's probably somebody else like there's there's a couple scenes there's a couple scenes where like the he's in the suit and his like face is visible but that could very easily be like done in post and not yeah not actually him in the suit so interesting i would not i would not necessarily uh put much stock into (laughs) him being in the suit interesting okay i've i've heard i've heard things i've heard things here today i'll let you know once once i get five and once i finish five and six um if it's worth the investment i would say i like because right now i'm like very much like at at the intrigued point but i've also been like and really enjoyed loki really enjoyed hawkeye um the rest of the shows i'm like indifferent on yeah so it's like this is obviously different being six episodes versus i guess loki was loki was six eight something like that wandavision must have been the longest at 10 um so it's not like a full but these are like 50 minute episodes um so it's like i guess falcon and the winter soldier was like that um yeah but what's the next what's the next mcu show is that is that miss marvel miss marvel i think yeah interesting all right well there you have it folks there you have it indeed and that wraps up our episode thank you all for tuning in week in and week out we appreciate the support could not do it without you and we love getting inside the film room and putting this on for you Hell yeah. Great to be back. Lots of fun to discuss here. Dune, Batman, and otherwise Oscar shenanigans. Um, Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, like us on Facebook to keep up with all things inside the film room, memes, giveaways, all that good stuff. And subscribe on YouTube. That's where you can find interviews. Zach keeps pumping out for the the site and the channel. Great content there, as well as our podcast episodes, if you want to listen to them there. And you can find all those social pages at Inside Film Room. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter so you can get everything delivered straight to your inbox. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio, anywhere there's a podcast, we are there. And be sure to come back next time because we'll see you then.